Hello and welcome to Skipton, an historic town known as the gateway to the Yorkshire Dales, where one of England's best preserved medieval castles sits at the end of a high street with independent shops and market stalls lining the cobbles. We're at the Plaza Cinema, a traditional movie house dating back to 1912. According to a local paper, The Telegraph and Argus, back in the day the cinema's management kept rowdy filmgoers in check using a long pole with a stuffed boxing glove on the end to give people a jab if they played up. I'm sure we won't need it with our panel tonight. All hailing from the north of England, we have Baroness Jenny Chapman, who was the Labour MP for her hometown of Darlington until she lost her seat in 2019. She's now a Labour peer and Shadow Minister for the Cabinet Office and Education. Before politics, Jenny studied psychology at Brunel University and has an MA in archaeology from Durham University. David Davis is the Conservative MP for Holton Price and Howden and a former Brexit secretary. He first entered Parliament in 1987. Blimey, David. Did you say 1897? <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> and he has twice stood to be leader of the Conservative Party, though neither time successfully. David joined the SAS after school before studying molecular and computer science at Warwick University. Nazir Afsal is Chancellor of the University of Manchester and a former Chief Crown Prosecutor for North West England. He's worked on some of the most high-profile cases in the country, with a special focus on domestic violence, child sex abuse and honour-based violence. His law degree comes from the University of Birmingham, where he grew up, and his memoir, The Prosecutor, is currently being adapted for a multi-part drama series. David Kerfoot is a businessman and Deputy Lieutenant of North Yorkshire. He's the co-founder of the Kerfoot Group, which he started with his wife Elizabeth in a back bedroom in 1980 and grew to a multi-million pound company manufacturing and supplying natural oil. For 35 years, he's been assembling political memorabilia and he has quite the collection, we may hear more later. In the New Year's Honours, David was awarded a CBE for his service to rural businesses and the voluntary and community sector, which he said wasn't just for him but for wonderful North Yorkshire. Skipton, please welcome your Any Questions panel. <laughs> and so to our first, which comes from Sarah Riley. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Um, with a shortfall of around 130,000, how might nurse recruitment and retention be improved? Sarah, thank you. We have seen this week that vacancies across the NHS in England have risen to a new record high, one in ten post-vacant. So Sarah asks, how can recruitment and retention be improved? Jenny Chapman. Well, m both my parents were nurses, so um, I know a little bit about this, about what it's like um, to grow up with a parent who's a nurse and the hours and some of the, the pressures um, that they faced. And I think... There are a few things you need to do. I think the first thing is about stability and planning in the NHS, because I know we're going to hear a lot about pay, and obviously that is an issue too. But when I speak to nurses, I think the thing that's really making them feel that they might not want to continue is this issue of, of pressure, of they know that they're not being able at the moment to give quite the care that they would like to give and that they were trained to give and that they know that they can give, because of the, the systemic pressures that there are on the health service. And you've got to remember that we went into the COVID pandemic you know, with 100,000 vacancies in the NHS, and that shows. So that's why, if you forgive me for getting straight into the party politics of this, that's why we've said that we want to raise money from abolishing the non-dom tax status to spend on nurses and doctors training, because we need more people working on our wards in the health service. Until you fix that, I just don't think you're going to see an end to, sadly, um, people leaving the service. And it is a real shame because you've got people with decades of experience. Um, and if we're losing that, you, know, you really can't put a value on it. And I, I, I feel very sad about what's happening to the NHS at the moment. It, it's, a, it's the greatest tragedy of the last 12 years. And I, I feel that actually the government isn't... It isn't leading the way, there's no, there's no strategy, there's no plan, and you are seeing it in patient outcomes, the number of excess deaths that we're seeing at the moment. It's, it's, it's deeply, deeply concerning, and you know, I think until you deal with some of those long-term fundamental issues, and pay too, 
then I think we're not going to see an end to the problems that we're facing currently. Jenny, let me just put a point to you, because sure. Labour has said there'll be a workforce strategy for, yep. for the NHS workforce. The government said they're working on a workforce strategy for the NHS workforce. Of course, training takes time. So if Labour was in power now, or if Labour gets in power in a couple of years at the next general election, what's the immediate solution? Well, the training does take time, but that's why you have to start today. You know, we should have been starting years and years ago and what the Tories did with nursing bursaries and what they've done with failing to work in a coordinated way with our, our universities and our health schools is why we've got to where we are. And yes, there will be things that you need to do immediately. Of course there are. Like you need to sort out this issue with ambulances, queuing up outside um, A&E and unable to um, take their patients into hospital and then move on to the next patient. And people are are dying waiting for ambulances you, know, you do have to deal with that but unless you address those more medium to long-term issues we will find ourselves in this situation year after year after year and that's why the Labour Party has a plan that would deal with the longer term problem okay David Davis, specifically to the question, how might recruitment and retention be improved? Well, the, there is no... Firstly, you asked Jenny, what's the sort of immediate answer? There is no instant answer. I mean, this takes, as, as Jenny said, she, it, it takes time. Um, one thing I would do is I would remove the requirement for a degree for nursing. Bluntly. I think that's actually Labour policy. Right? Um, when, when, uh, when I was in John Major's government, we actually imposed the requirement. I don't think it did any good. I mean, a lot of people around my part of London, when I lived there in South London, uh, young girls particularly, were, that was their great career. And suddenly we shut it off for them. You know? so, uh, so I think there's, there's a lot to be done there. I think we have to work on easy return. You know, people go, uh, going off to, to... You mean coming uh, back to the workplace? Coming back to the workforce is, is, is important too. You know, and this is, going to be, this is going to be a forever problem, I'll say. I mean, you know, we have more people working in the NHS now than we ever have, but we've still got a forever problem with it. So, so I think uh, those two things will be my two most instant responses. David Davis, thank you. Nazir Afsal. Uh, pay them more. It'll be a good start. Uh, <laughs> So many, of them, I mean, so many of them are deciding to go off and do delivery work or anything else because they can't afford to pay their bills and, we, and they simply can't carry on like that. So the cost of living, as we all know what it's like, uh, better pay and better conditions will be one way of keeping those that we have, for starters. I think there's a, there's a case to be said for those who've recently resigned or, or, or retired, perhaps bringing them back uh, as a short-term um, response, given the, the dangers or the, the workloads that we're currently facing. When my, when my mother was dying uh, from palliative, she was receiving palliative care at home a couple of years ago during uh, COVID. Not, she didn't die from COVID. Uh, and a district nurse was visiting every day uh, phenomenal person and halfway through the, the various times she was coming um, she burst into tears in front of me and she said uh, I realized what it was wasn't she wasn't crying because of um, my mum passing away she was crying because of the number of people she was seeing on a single day she was crying because even despite uh, the phenomenal work that she was doing that once a week she'd have to go to a food bank and I think we, we really do need to ensure that we value the people that do this work, to make sure that we invest in them, absolutely right, uh, that we need to reduce their workloads, um, and we've got to somehow stop poaching from developing countries. Um, because you have to remember, we, we have to take tens of thousands from developing countries uh, who themselves would need nurses, but because we can pay them more, we bring them over there. We're just taking somebody else's, or giving somebody else a problem for the problem that we have. So there's... Ms. Zero, I appreciate you're not in government, but you'll be aware of the, of the dispute that's going on at the moment between the Royal College of Nursing and the government over pay. You mentioned pay. So um, the demand from the Royal College of Nursing is something up to 19% pay rise. I'm interested in your take on that, an inflationary rate plus pay rise for nurses. Generally, if you want, uh, I mean, we're going to hear from a, an entrepreneur in a moment, if you want the best talent, you pay for the best prices. Uh, and given where we are in terms of the market, we don't have enough people doing the work, we desperately need them in, we should pay them over the odds, in effect, to get them here. Even if we didn't have the unions, we'd still have the crisis in the NHS. So it's absolutely key, I think, that we pay what, we deserve, what they deserve in order for us to be able to provide the service that we all want. Yes. 
David Kerfoot. I think nurses deserve fair pay, certainly. And it's very, very important for this country that they get some recompense because we face some really serious challenges. We lost 40,000 uh, nurses who left the profession last year, and there are currently 47,000 vacancies. And one of the things that I've picked up is that um, the student nurse bursary was actually dropped by a previous health uh, minister. And I think that's quite an important uh, position to look at because student nurses work on paid on the wards. They do all sorts of jobs, unpaid. And that is no incentive for them to, to take the situation further and to move on. And therefore, I would like to see that bursary for nurses, uh, for student nurses, certainly reinstated. The other thing that I cannot understand in the, the National Health Service as a whole is, why do we spend so much money on locum doctors and agency nurses? You know, we should be training our own nurses. David, thank you. Now, we don't have anyone here from the government, so in fairness, I'm going to read a statement from the Department uh, of Health and Social Care. A spokesman there said the government was giving the NHS an extra £6.6 .6 billion and will publish a workforce strategy next year with independently verified forecasts for the number of doctors, nurses and other professionals that will be needed in 5, 10 and 15 years' time. Sarah, you asked this question. I just want to go back to you. I don't know if you have a personal experience of working in the NHS, but what, what's your answer or suggestion to your own question, if I may? Well, I've worked as a nurse for 40 years. Um, I'd suggest for those in post, pay the promised £500 one-off bonus uh, for their efforts during the pandemic. Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland have paid this. Provide bursaries on which student nurses can actually live, not merely survive. Offer a pay deal in line with inflation. Bring back on-site nursery facilities at affordable costs offer subsidised or free healthy meals for nurses and other staff all hours of the day, which they have to work all hours of the day, and subsidised car parking to start with. Sarah, thank you for your question and your solutions. You never know who might be listening. A reminder that if you want to have a say on this or, in fact, on anything else that we discuss uh, on the programme, call Anita Anand. She's on Any Answers. Lines open 12.30 p.m. on Saturday. The number is 03700 100 444. That's 03700 100 444. Now, on to our second, which comes from Sheil. Hello. Hello. Um, <clears throat> do we feel that we still have a problem with racism in this country when the late Queen's former lady-in-waiting, Susan Hussey, still insists on asking an ethnic British person where she is from. Jill, thank you. So we know this is something that... This is something that happened this week. So a black British charity boss, Ngozi Falani, uh, was at an event in a, a royal reception when she was repeatedly asked by Lady Susan Hussey uh, where she was from. Nazir. Yes, of course we, do. we have a problem of racism in this country and um, anything to pretend otherwise uh, would, be, would be a lie. I was actually at that Buckingham, <laughs> I was at that Buckingham Palace reception. Uh, what was your experience, if you don't yeah, mind? I was sharing. actually at that Buckingham Palace reception, and uh, Lady Hussey did come up to me, and I had a, a label saying Nazir Afsal. I was invited by the Welsh Government, Nazir Afsal, Welsh Government, and she asked me where I was from, too. Um, so, um, what, uh, what did you did say? say well, you I mind? said, Welsh Government. <laughs> Even though I wasn't, but that's what the label said. Um, the, the point, the, you make a very valid point. Uh, the reality is, uh, her ex our experience, people of colour in this country, uh, minorities more generally, experience it all the time. I mean, I was breathing black and blue when I was young. I remember three guys hit me around the head, uh, used, me, used my head as a football, and um, I lived to tell the tale. Uh, I've suffered it throughout my career. Even when I was chief prosecutor, the former, former, former prime minister, Theresa May, asked me uh, how it was that there was structural racism when I was a chief prosecutor. I said, have you got a few minutes, prime minister? Um, <laughs> because the reality... Only a few minutes. Well, it, it took a few minutes. Uh, because I mean, one of the things that's really shamed me about the events of this week is the attempt now to blame the victim. Mm. 
uh, oh, why was she wearing African clothes, African hat or whatever it was, uh, that somehow that's the reason why she asked. Look, I'm not after Lady Hussey. She's apologised and she's resigned. The bigger issues is, is at stake here. Uh, the reality of our experience is that um, if you are, for example, a black person, you're not nine times more likely to be stopped and searched. You, if you're a black or brown person, you're more likely to be arrested, you're more likely to be charged, you're more likely to be sentenced, uh, convicted sentenced, on the same evidence as a white person. The prisons are full of people who should not be in prison, but they are because of the colour of their skin. The uh, reality of our experience, look at the health inequalities. Who, you know, people who died when COVID first struck were the Asian doctors and the Asian nurses, you know, because they were at the front line. Asian taxi drivers, Asian bus drivers, because they were at the front line. So time and time again, there's evidence and experience of, our, of the experience of people of colour, which sadly uh, will not get any better. And so the point is, I mean, only last week, I, well, this week, I published my review of London Fire Brigade, which showed that Fire Brigade was institutionally racist. Uh, and there were many examples in that, including a fire, fire officer who had a noose placed above his a locker, another Muslim fire officer who had bacon put in his pockets. You know, this is today's experience, not the experience that I had when I was a youth or some time ago, or, you know, Powell's time. So don't blame the victims, blame the perpetrators, hold the perpetrators to account, keep doing it all the time, and that's how we will get, out of, out of, get ourselves out of this terrible situation in the world. <laughs> David Kerfoot, you would have seen that the palace responded pretty quickly. Um, you know, they said they take the incident extremely seriously. Uh, as Nazir said, uh, the Lady Susan Hussey resigned from her post. Uh, a spokesman for Prince William said racism to no place in our society. The comments were completely unacceptable. But to the question, do you still feel we have a problem with racism in the country? I'm in a, a strange situation in that I'm a deputy lieutenant of our wonderful county. So I work in the Lord Lieutenant's team, and the Lord Lieutenant and ourselves represent um, His Majesty within the county. And our work is very, very extensive, and we do a lot of different things. And it's very, very difficult, in fact, now impossible for me to be able to make a comment on this particular issue at this particular time. But what I will say on a personal basis is this, that there is no place for racism anywhere within our society, either now or in the future. Thank you. Jenny Chapman. Well, I think to answer that saying that there isn't, it would be an incredibly naive thing to do, and I don't think anybody in the, on this panel is going to give you uh, a different answer to the one you've heard. I was incredibly struck by what N N uh, Nazir had to say, uh, and I, I just think that, you know, that, that calling it out, that what, the way that the, the palace dealt with it was surely the right thing to do. I've been slightly disturbed by some of the sort of, oh, but she was 83 chat that we've had around. You know, it's not OK. Just to be and clear, it's Lady Susan Hussey who's 83. Indeed, yes. Um, but, I, you know, if you're in a position like that, you're in an incredibly p privileged position. You are representing all of us, in a sense, when you're hosting or joining in hosting those events um, at the palace. And it is right that they dealt with it quickly. And actually, I don't think they would have dealt with it quite so quickly a few years ago. So is that something, you know, that, that we should acknowledge? Yes, I think it probably is. But to pretend that we don't still have some very, very serious, deep-seated problems that we need to keep on focusing on, and the work that Nazir did with the London Fire Brigade, I think, is a first-class example of actually how you lift the lid on some of this and share what's been happening so that it can be dealt with, because surely the worst thing we could ever do is pretend that this doesn't happen. And when he you know, reveals the misogyny, the homophobia, the racism that was there in our uniform services, I find that quite disturbing. Um, and I'm pleased that there are leaders um, in those services who want to take it on and tackle it, and they should have our full support. Thank you. The commissioner of the London Fire Brigade, Andy Rowe, he said he was horrified and heartbroken to read the report that you mentioned, Azir, the report uh, that you wrote he said there's no place for discrimination harassment or bullying in the brigade um, but back to the center point of shield's question if i can david davis do you think there's a problem with racism in this country and if so what do we do about that 
Well, the answer is yes. Um, I mean, I just say that Jenny is right to say that the palace did the right thing uh, in this. I, I mean, I don't know what they would have done years ago. I imagine the Queen would have dealt with it equally briskly, frankly. But, the, but they did the right thing and very quickly. And this isn't one of those areas of human society which requires permanent vigilance. You know, it's racism, sectarianism, homophobia, all the phobias, frankly. Uh, and we have to fight them all the time. It's one of the reasons we fight so hard. I mean, Nazir and I, and indeed Jenny, have been involved in things like the stop and search issues, things, as you mentioned, uh, uh, all the evidence-based justice arguments we've made, all about not locking people up. The, even things like not locking people up for 90 days was actually about uh, a, a sort of religious prejudice yeah. issue as well. So, so it's one of those issues where we have to fight all the time. I mean, every single society in the world suffers from this, uh, and every single society in the world should be vigilant about it. Uh, and actually, I think Britain, I mean, we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much. Britain is pretty good at facing up to this. You did what you did, the, the previous reports on the Met. Just because so it's radio, you're, you're yeah. referring to Nazir. Uh, sorry, yes, I beg your pardon. Yes, know what Nazir did. Sorry, Nazir, for the, for the listeners, is sitting next to me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of waving at him. Um, uh, the, uh, those, are, those come up time and time again, and we must fight against them every single time. And I'm proud of this country because, generally speaking, we do. Uh, absolutely, I, I'm glad everybody's on the same page, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that everybody in the audience is in the same page too. But the other, but one bit of other work I did was in relation to another police force, not the Met, where um, after the Grenfell fire, I, you know, I'm wearing the Grenfell badge, which is, uh, as you remember, a terrible stain on this country. 72 lives were lost in that fire. Um, six, three quarters of them were Muslim, uh, many of them from minority communities. Uh, in the immediate aftermath, some police officers in another force were sharing an image of the Grenfell tire with the words, the great Muslim bake-off written underneath. Police officers sharing that with each other on WhatsApp. Again, the important thing to be said, one of the important, is that we're going to hold them to account for it. We found out, but we found out by chance. So to answer your question, yes, it's absolutely there. It's still embedded. And as, as David said a moment ago, we have to be vigilant 100% of the time. Thank you. If you want to have your say on this, give Anita a call. She's on Any Answers on Saturday. Lines open 12.30pm, 03700 100 444. Now on to our third, which comes from Steve Gilbert. Hello, Steve. Following weeks of disruption, what should happen to restore and improve passenger railway services in the north of England? Steve, thank you. We know that uh, Avanti West Coast, Northern and Trans Pennine Express, all rail services in the north of England, are getting fewer than half their services to arrive on time. We know there have also been cancellations. So what should happen, David Kerfoot? We all want our trains to run and to run on time, don't we? But I think in the north of England we're getting a poor deal, a very poor deal. Because the fact is, the plain fact is to me, that if, if it was happening in the South East, it would be an emergency. And it would be on the... <laughs> but the reality is, is that we're getting the bad deal. And indeed, you know, the talks with the minister the other day, Mr Harper, where the several mayors got together with him and laid it completely on the line that we cannot continue with this kind of situation. It's absolutely appalling. Because let's face it, it's got to be something really basic where someone can get to work or to get into education on time and not have to depend on a system. Like, for example, Trans Pennine, who are just quite remarkable in the number of cancellations, the way those cancellations are calculated. I, I don't think the word's remarkable. I think it's disgraceful, isn't it? That's... Okay. So, you know, I think one of the things that we really do need is we seem to jump from plan to plan. Yeah. We never seem to have a consistent, longer-term strategy, like a business would have. So what we need now is a proper plan, and a proper plan for reform of the rail system. I could go on and on about this, but I'm getting an indication from, uh, fr from Alex. So I really think we're in a bad situation, and we've really got to move on in a strong and forceful way. 
you mentioned the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper. He did meet um, mayors from across the, the north to discuss this this week. He said there is a real problem. He's under no illusions there's a real problem to solve here. He's focused on trying to deliver those better services for passengers. How do you do that, Jenny Chapman? Well, Mark Harper, MP for the Forest of Dean, acknowledges there's a problem. Well, thank you very much. Where have you been? You know, this has been going on well, for he's years. He's not been in a job that long. This is, he's been an MP for longer than I was an MP before 2010. This has been going on for years and years. It's an absolute disgrace. David ran out of time, so I'm going to pick up where he left off, which I agree with every single word he said, is about a plan. Now, we had a plan called Northern Powerhouse Rail. Where is it? It had cross-party support. We want to see it delivered. We need it. Every single person in this cinema tonight, I bet, has had a bad experience on the trains if you've tried to use them recently. I had one getting here today. I missed my connection in Leeds. This can't go on. You know, when we say this wouldn't be tolerated in the South, you bet it wouldn't. You know, the trains where I live in the Tees Valley are the old bus rolling stock from God knows where, but they were, they were deemed not to be good enough for wherever they were in the south of England, and they've been palmed off on Teesside. Now, I'm not one of these people who sort of spent a political life complaining about the south gets everything, the north gets now, but I tell you, on this issue, it's really hard not to compare. We've got to have that investment. We need it long term. We need the plan. We've got to get our MPs, our mayors on the same page with our business people, which is what we had with Northern Powerhouse Rail, we need to stick to that plan and we need to get it delivered because like so many other things, unless you get on with it when it's a long-term issue, this is going to take many, many years to deliver. We know that. It's not like flicking a switch, but you've, you've got to make progress. And the fact that they, you know, one prime minister says it's happening, then the next one says it isn't, and then this one's, I don't know what Sunak's saying about it. To well, be Jeremy with you. Hunt, it's Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, in the autumn statement said, the core Northern Powerhouse Rail will go ahead and they're protect, protecting their capital budget so they can make as many other worthwhile additions to our transport infrastructure as possible. So core Northern but Powerhouse Rail happening. What does that mean? You know, when, what does would, that mean? Would we have a plan to, or we don't? Would Labour commit to Northern yeah, Powerhouse we Rail want, in full, absolutely, no question? The Labour Party would be delivering Northern Powerhouse Rail. We would be, be very, very clear about it. And look at Avanti, £12 million to their shareholders recently. They are not delivering on their franchise. Those franchises need... If they can't deliver... Get out of the way and let somebody else do it, because we just cannot tolerate this any longer. So the, the boss of Avanti West Coast and Trans Pennine has apologised for the disruption to services. He says it's been caused by a backlog of driver training during the pandemic, and that because of sickness levels and drivers not working overtime, the company wasn't able to fill the gaps. We understand the inconvenience this is causing people. It's something we're trying to correct. David Davis, what needs to be done? Well, Trans Pennine, let's, let's pick on Trans Pennine, because it's quite an interesting example. It, uh, mostly what we've been talking about takes a long time to fix. This is a badly managed railroad. I'll be blunt about it, it's a badly managed railroad. And they cheat, frankly, with the numbers. They claim cancellations, I think, four to 9%. In practice, they use a trick because it's actually 20 to 30%. Uh, and my view on this, uh, the Transport Secretary should, do, should, be, uh, should have one clear thing to do. He should say to them, fix it within a strict timetable or you lose the franchise. End of story. You lose the franchise. Um, and, and, you know, because look, if you look at all the causes, there are a whole variety of causes, some of them industrial relations, some of them training, some of them other things, but they're all management. So lose the franchise. In October, Avanti's contract was extended, but only by six months, because yeah. the government said they have to drastically improve. So yeah. that's the point you're making, you'd like it cut off if they don't, effectively? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the advantage you have with a private sector operation is you can do that. You know, you can actually say, if you don't do the job, you lose the, you lose the job. Uh, and, it, uh, and it's the only way you're going to get a fast delivery on it. Nazir. Well, the, the North gave the railways to the world. Uh, and we've still got the one. We've still got the ones from 1850s something, haven't we? Um, I think what was you know when I first came up here uh, 11 years ago, I was going on that what you, what you described the old buses with railway wheels, um, because I thought, what's going on? Uh, surely you know this this is out of date and shouldn't be in place. We spent 
more on one station on the Elizabeth Line, which is the new crossrail, than they've spent on the whole of the North Railway system. So that, that tells you something about priorities. Uh, I'm very fortunate, I work with the, uh, there's an organization called the People's Powerhouse, which is a, a group of volunteers, people who want to bring the voices of the North to, ever, to the, those who don't want to hear it. Uh, because the people have been missing from every plan that's been talked about. People need to be at the center of this. We can't have a situation, quite frankly, you mentioned several mayors meeting with uh, the minister. One of the mayors couldn't make it because of the trains. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tracy Rabin, and, I think. and then when you go on a train, 300 pounds, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, that's, the, that's it. The train might not turn up, uh, it may not be punctual. Uh, profits are being made. The only, there's only one answer in my mind, bring the companies into public ownership. Okay. If you... If you have a view, give Anita a call. Anita Arnand is on Any Answers, Saturday lunchtime, 03700 100 444. You're listening to Any Questions on BBC Radio 4, coming to you from the Plaza Cinema in Skipton. A reminder, if you want to host us, then drop us a line. Any questions at bbc.co.uk. Now, on to our next, which comes from Brian. Hello, Brian. Hello. Would the imposition of VAT on independent school fees be an attack on the aspirations of hard-working families or a very good example of levelling up? What do you think, Brian? Personally, I think uh, as a, an ex-independent school head teacher, it's always been an embarrassment that independent schools uh, have had charitable status and haven't paid VAT. So you're an, an ex-independent... <laughs> You're an ex-independent school head teacher, but you'd like to see that tax break gone. Absolutely. Brian, thank you. <laughs> Jenny Chapman, this is something that Labour is proposing, but yeah. the argument against it, if I may, is that it may actually cause some private schools to close. Well... <laughs> you tempt me. Um, that's not what this is about. This is about a situation where the government hasn't really looked properly at providing a good education for our children for a very long time now. Um, you visit any school, speak to anybody who works in the sector, and they will tell you the same thing. We need to find some resources from somewhere. We think we can raise £1.7 billion by making this tax change. You look at a school like Winchester, £6 million tax break last year. This school has an art collection, a rifle range, you know, no, the schools my kids went to didn't have those things, I'll tell you that. So we need to get some extra resource into our state schools. This isn't about closing down schools, it's not about class war or any of that, it's just a really sensible way, we think, of shifting some money from schools that, frankly, can manage into schools that are desperately need that resource and supporting the 93% of children who are state educated in this country. Jenny, I'd like your thoughts on this. A report from the Independent Schools Council this week, which the obviously represents independent, independent schools, schools Council, a yes. very good point you make, and it's right that we say that. But it says that um, private schools contribute an annual £16.5 billion pounds to the economy with £5.1 billion pounds of tax contributed a year? Well, the Independent Schools Council is the lobbying arm of the um, independent schools and absolutely fair that they should state their case, but they've provided no evidence at all that by us um, changing the charitable status, because these schools do a lot of things and they are, they are lots of things to lots of people, but one thing they ain't is a charity. So, you know, all we're asking for them is to be treated for tax purposes in the way that properly fits um, the activities that they do. Brian knows, Brian gets it, he agrees with me. So. <laughs> Dave. David Davis, do you agree? Well, well I'm going to disagree with both Jenny and Brian, I'm afraid. The, the first thing is that, I mean, I have constituents who send their children to private school. Um, they're not aristocrats, they're not billionaires. Very often they give up holidays and they have older cars and they, uh, they save and scrimp. A bit like, and you can say, oh, you can say, oh, 
a bit like a bit like a bit like Mr. Sunak's parents did. You know, new new immigrants in the country, and they saved money uh, and worked hard to send their child to give him the best possible chance. Which, incidentally, we all do, don't we? Give our own children the best possible chance. Secondly, of course, it is right. If you do this and you put the VAT on, you'll lose about 150 schools. Now, every single person who pays for the schooling also, by the way pays taxes which would normally provide their, their own schooling. And I just loved being lectured by Mr. Starmer, who went with a, a, a state-funded place to a, to a fee-paying school. I went to a state school. But I still think people should have the right. And if you, and if you do end up with closing those 150 schools, you're going to have to replace those places, teach those children on the taxpayer anyway. So I do think, you said it wasn't class war? Yes, it is. It is class war. Now, <laughs> Now, now one, last, one last point, Alex, before, before. That I care more than most people about social mobility. That's what we should be worrying about, giving all our children the best possible chance, not punishing parents for giving their kids the best chance, giving the children the best possible chance, and we don't do it today yet. No. OK, Nazir. It's not the politics of envy, it's the politics of fairness. Um... <laughs> So I don't understand why Winchester can have a gun range, whereas, whereas uh, my children's school had a hole in the roof. Um, I, think, I think the two uh, need to be dealt with at the same time. And, you know, Finland, for example, has no taxpayer-funded private schools, because when you're not paying tax, that's what they are. They're taxpayer-funded private schools. Finland has none, but has the best education performance in Europe. Um, so, I, I'm, as, a, you know, as a parent, not, I went to a state school, my children have been to state schools. I'm not denying anybody the ability or the power to be able to pay for the education for their children. That's clearly the, the choice that people should be able to make. But, but that, I think you've just said a moment ago, they run like a business, they are a business, therefore let them pay taxes like a business. The Chancellor, Jeremy, Jeremy Hunt, during the autumn statement, that tax and spending plans that he set out, said according to certain estimates, if there was tax breaks abolished on private schools, it could result in up to 90,000 children from the independent sector going into the state sector and add pressure on it. Do you accept that point? Is that for me? Um, no, no, I don't. I mean, I don't accept that because we've already heard the independent um, public schools body. Uh, there are lots of voices. It's called Project Fear, actually, David. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, and, uh, you know, don't believe a word of it. Right. I, I was lucky enough to go to school when this country had the best social mobility in the world. What does that mean? It means a working class kid like me can make his way through school, go to university, go to two universities and get on in life. Today, we have the weakest social mobility in the, school, in, in the world, in the Western world. 35% of children at the age of 11 going to state school, mostly, but generally, 35% are not good enough in their maths or English to go on and, do, and learn properly. That's a disgrace to this country. That's what we should be worrying about. Yeah. Not, the, not the politics of envy, okay. not class war. How do we fix our education system okay. for the kids we have? David, thank you. David Perfect. Okay, 7% of our children go to private and go into private education. It's estimated that about four and a half billion pounds the Treasury uh, uh, um, uh, is otherwise would, would spend educating those children in the system. It contributes about five billion pounds in tax revenue and employs 300,000 people. One thing some people don't realise is that it's a great export business because we have some superb schools. And, you know, a lot of international students come and enjoy their time within that sector. But they have a responsibility. They have a social responsibility. And what I call that social responsibility is doing things like providing the bursaries, providing the scholarships, opening up the six forms, um, sharing sporting facilities and doing things together among other initiatives. And I think that needs to be reviewed, certainly, a lot, lot more closely for the future. But in general, I would say that I would want to see private education still maintained. And just for the record, I went to a state comprehensive. David Kerfoot, thank you. If you have a view, give Anita a call. She'd love to hear from you. 03700 100 444. Now, let's move on to our next, which comes from Jules Drummond-Hay. Hello. Hello. 
Will merging the Yorkshire local authorities into one mega authority improve democratic accountability? Jules, what do you think? It's mad. We live on the far east western side. To get to Whitby on the coast, it's a sort of two and a half, three hour drive, and it's an enormous conglomeration. I don't understand how it can possibly work. Thank you. For those who. <laughs> For those who might not have been following the minutiae of various devolution deals, as, as well as our audience clearly have here at the Plaza Cinema, this is a proposal, a devolution deal, so handing power from Whitehall down. It's worth about £540 million over 30 years for York and North Yorkshire. It would mean there'd be a directly elected mayor covering the whole area. So uh, to the question then, what do you make of it, David Kerford? I am so passionate about this. I just can't tell you enough because... We, we love was, passion. When I, was, when I was uh, chairman of the LEP, I got sick and tired... Forgive me, the local enterprise partnership, this was. The local enterprise partnership, local which enterprise was a body... Partnership for York, North Yorkshire and East Riding. I got fed up of going down to Whitehall and meeting ministers and MPs and civil servants and being told, oh, oh, well, you know, North Yorkshire, yeah, we're in the, really, really the second league. We're not at the top table. This devolution will give us a seat at the top table. And we must grasp it. And we must drive it forward. Well, what we're going to get? We're going to get more powers, more local decision making, definitely more local decision making, more funding initially, 540 million pounds, which we haven't seen before, into our regions to do all the kind of things that we want to do. We've got problems with bus services being cut at the moment. And it's so important to our oil services. That is something that a newly elected mayor could in fact take under his umbrella and run, instead of having the competitive situation we've got now. There are so many things that we can do with this devolution. And we sit at the top table and we are listened to. Notice the other day when Mr Harper, the minister, came, all the mayors were there. Where was the representative from North Yorkshire? And that's what it's all about. And I urge you, with every spirit in your body, to... There will be initial problems, there will be challenges, but take it, because we've never had an opportunity in North Yorkshire like this in the last 50 years. David, thank you. We're talking about North Yorkshire, but it's worth saying that it isn't the only place in line for a devolution deal. There was one, I think, signed with Cornwall on Friday by the Minister, Deanna Davison. There are others in the pipeline. David Davis, what do you make of this? Well, sometimes I think people in London have a pe peculiar idea of how big our county is, you know? Uh, often, when I, early on in my career, they used to say, uh, oh, you're from Yorkshire, do you bump into William Hague much? You know? <laughs> yeah, he, he lives an hour and a half away from me by car. You know? um, so, I mean, I, I am not a huge enthusiast for, uh, for this devolution. If local people want it, and that, by that I mean by plebiscite, by referendum, if they decide they want it, then fine. But if you're just going off the back of the views of the councillor who might become the mayor, or the person who might be in charge, then I, wouldn't, I don't care at all whether you have a seat at the top table. I want the rights for the individuals in the county. So only, only if the locals actually vote for it. Jenny Chapman, the, the former Labour Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, is actually looking at devolution mm. at the moment. There's a commission set up to see whether or not more devolution across England as well as the nations would be beneficial. What do you think? I think it is. I mean, we are far too centralised as a country. We're one of the most uh, centralised countries in the OECD, and it's one of the reasons um, that we're struggling with growth, because decisions, and we've been talking about rail, um, decisions are made um, in London, by and large, and actually the voices of local people just aren't part of the conversation. It is a massive problem and we need to fix it. I think the only way you fix that is through devolution. Now, I've got my problems with the way this government is going about it. Um, I think the deals that we've had, for a start, they're deals which put the mayor, uh, the mayors of combined authorities, into a very sort of almost like a parent-child relationship with the minister in some ways, and they have to worry about you know, their relationship with government, and they shouldn't have to do that. These deals should be secure. These are the, 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 the powers of these mayors should be secure. They should feel that they can really stand up and do the, the right thing by their local communities. There is a question about consent. You know, I feel 
quite strongly about this. My dad, and Alex is waving at me now not to go off on a story, but my dad was We're born hurtling in, towards the end. We only have a few minutes left. When he was born, it was part of Yorkshire, then becomes part of Cleveland. Now it's Tees Valley. You know, people get a bit fed up with being told where they live. And I think that is it's part of your identity, and it does matter. So we need to do a much, much better job of involving local people in the ways these things are done. But believe me, if we do not have more devolution, however it is done, away from London, into the north of England, and to be fair, probably the southwest and the east of England and other places too, then this country is never going to move forward in the way that we really could. OK. I am encouraging gently my panellists to be brief because we're in the final few minutes. But Nazir, what do you think yeah, of this proposal and more broadly the, the prospect of devolution? Well, I'm, very, I'm a very strong believer in devolution. I think um, I trust you locally to spend your money better than I trust Westminster to do it for you. Um, I'm a strong believer in um, it's not a coup d'etat, a coup de north. Um, I, I, I'm, I agree with David here. Um, you should be asked. Uh, to vote for this. Uh, it shouldn't just be a, a fait accompli where you're asked to do it, because the reality is that, uh, again, you're just being given, being given scraps, off the, scraps off the table. Devolution without the money is being given all the responsibility and none of the power. Um, and, and, and I think it also needs to be said, uh, big isn't always better. OK. I mean, the government is looking at discussions with local authorities across the country to work out what kind of devolution they're looking for. Is, does that satisfy yeah, you? Very much so. I mean, I, I, I'm a strong supporter of the metro mayor concept, I think. I think the metro mayors that I know have worked really effectively in bringing people together and, and, and making sure that the voices of the North or the voices of the Midlands are heard. Um, but as I go back to my point, doing it with, with a little bit of money here and a little bit of money there, you're not really being trusted to do it, are you? OK, thank you. If you want to have a say on devolution or on nurses' retention or on what happened at the palace or on anything else we've spoken about during the course of this programme, give Anita Arnand a call on any answers, 03700 100 444. But I'm afraid to say we have come to the end. It always goes far too quickly for my liking. But I do want to say a, a thank you to the panel, of course, for their time this evening. A thank you to the Plaza Cinema in Skipton for hosting us here. A thank you all for coming along. And to you at home, thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>